a treat for us this morning. I know you're going to be glad you are here on time. Sandy Heinz is here with us. She is a uh, former core leader of daytime class, but she is a, now a core leader of our night class. Sandy is going to share with us God at work in her life through CBS and through her passion for caring for the aged. And I know it's going to be a blessing to you all. So welcome with me, Sandy Heinz. Thank you. Thank you. I don't need that. Good. Would you all pray with me? Uh, Heavenly Father, it is good to be in your house. I thank you for letting me return to this morning class, and I thank you for the words that you've um, spoken to me, and I pray that every lady here will um, just be touched to see how much you move in each of our lives. Lord, calm my heart, um, and may um, you be glorified this morning. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wrote this for Happy New Year, but anyway, happy February. Um, when the sheet came around um, for sign up for a devotion, literally, I have to share with you, my whole being shivered as I was humbled by where I was sitting and how it came to be. So here I am reflecting. So let me begin by giving you the Google definition of what the verb means, reflect. So first of all, it could be a surface of a body that throws back heat, light, sound, without absorbing it. The second definition is to think deeply or carefully about something, consider it, review it, contemplate it, study it. So for me, the start of 2019, um, I has, I've been contemplating, reviewing how God has moved me. So for the past three years, I felt that um, God has moved a word in me to claim and walk in for the year. I'm sure some of you may have done that. You may have seen it on Facebook. So for 2018, that word for me was commit. It was commit to seeking God's face, commit to my husband and my family and relationships, and commit to my work. You see, five and a half years ago, I sat where you were sitting. I was serving in leadership and felt God reviving the desire in my heart um, to serve seniors and allow them to age with grace and dignity. I chose to follow the prompting and obey with open arms. I stepped out with great faith. I started a business, God's business, in serving seniors and their families. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. But then there is the next verse in verse 7. <laughs> Do not be wise in your own eyes. Well, in my own eyes, I could not walk away from CBS. I literally kept thinking, I started this business in CBS. Clearly, he doesn't want me to leave it. He wants me to continue to make time for him. He wants me to be committed to CBS and be here all the time. So three out of four years, I attempted to attend. I started, I stopped, no commitment, no trust in the business, and quite frankly, being wise in my own eyes. How pitiful, how sad. I have to share that the years leading to 2018 were quite the roller coaster. The business would ebb and flow, but mostly grow, but I felt much discontent in my walk with God. So my reflection in late 2017 was to commit. Commit to trust the Lord above all, to seek Him in all matters, Jeremiah 27, 3 says, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. Walk in all the ways I command you, and it will be well with you. I felt alone in the journey of the business. I loved who I was serving. I loved meeting the people and the families. I've prayed at bedsides. Um, I have cried elephant tears with families. Um, and I have rejoiced in healing here and when the Lord has called them home. It has been a privilege but where I didn't feel adequate or at all content was running the business. You see, I have a background in chemistry, <laughs> in biology, and public policy. Um, my one business class to test my skills was accounting, which I failed. Um, who puts credits and debits on the opposite side of a page? I kept trying to do it my way to figure it out, but I struggled with letting go and letting God take that part. Um, I yearned for a Christian mentor, how to run a business that glorified God, and even more basic, how to run a business. Come to me, all who are labor and heavy, all who are labored and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in my souls. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. My commitment was to lay that burden down, to seek God for every answer and trust he would provide to answer. I can't hardly stand where my reflection of 2018 has shown. God showed up big. I was introduced to a Christian CEU group called C12. I have a Christian business mentor who continues to challenge me to stretch my faith. Through this partnership and an accountability group, I'm surrounded by God-fearing men and women who have been gifted with a company from God. The passion these individuals have to serve Christ is powerful and humbling. One exercise we did was to evaluate our business as a mission field. Never thought of that. As we studied the first week in Acts um, 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all of Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When I began to count the number of employees I hire annually, when I add the number of clients I have, the family members, the staff at hospitals or other health care providers and settings, the franchisor I affiliate with and its staff, the professional organizations I affiliate with, and the marketers and other health industries that I partner with. I was humbled by the mission field God has given me to minister, to be a light. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the lights of the knowledge of the glory to God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Lord, that number, ladies, was in the thousands that I reach. My second reflection was how God answered my heart to be refueled in fellowship with other believers. As I shared, I finally had to walk away from CBS. I couldn't do it. The challenge of attending a day class and running a business, God's business, just did not allow me to attend and left a whole, huge hole in my heart. This has been a part of my life and my walk for multiple years. But how sweet that God orchestrated an evening class for me to attend. An evening class that did not even exist at the beginning of 2018. Not only did he open up the doors, but the study was Acts, a study that I stepped away from 10 years ago, and he redeemed that time by allowing me to, me to study it again this year. A study on the power of the Holy Spirit, ladies. You see, commitment to 2018 was to be still and listen to God, Psalm 46.10. To deliver 146.10, to delight myself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Psalm 37, 4 and 5. The boldness and perseverance to share Jesus through Paul's eyes um, just grasped me with light, knowing that I could have that again in this study this year. My third reflection was how God orchestrated my husband to join the business. And I had not even entertained that idea. Five years ago, when I sat here and thought about this business, my husband indicated to me that this was my baby. Um, he supported me, but did not want to be at all active in my business. My business verse is Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That is me. I am the hands, the feet to serve Christ and glory to the Lord. My sweet husband and partner, he, he has an MBA. Laying down and recognizing the needs for Jesus to manage the business, to truly lay at the cross, because the last couple of years on my own strength was clearly not working, I committed to look carefully then how you walk not as unwise as wise. I could not have imagined that in October of 2018, my husband Dan would be full-time in the business. He also would join C12 and have a business Christian accountability group. John 10.10. The thief comes to kill, to destroy, and to steal. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. These three reflections continue to amaze me how abundantly he answered my prayers, spoken and unspoken. I want to go now back to my primary reflection of light, to throw back light without absorbing it. My business verse after praying five years ago for God to show me a verse that reflected the vision he gave me um, this business presented itself again in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As I reflected on what God has done this year through my commitment to seek God first, my prayer is that I am more reflective um, to the world that God has placed right before me, not all the distractions I've added. 
I love from our study that we have our appointed places in the work of the kingdom. Some of us travel to make disciples of Christ, and some of us are a light for the Lord in our circle of influence. Ladies, I challenge you to sit and reflect on who you face in your daily interactions and the impact each of us has on God's plan for us to make disciples of Christ. I wonder if the number will bring you to your knees like it did for me. Thank you. You all have a great morning. Thank you, Sandy. Beautiful job. You ladies are dismissed to your core groups. Have a great morning. Our children have a wonderful morning um, that they've already been um, learning the story about when Jesus called some of his disciples. He was up at the Sea of Galilee. He was beginning his ministry, and he went and he called some fishermen. And so our children are learning. Uh, they have all kinds of fishing poles and fishing stories, and they're making some fishing nets, and they'll have little fish in them uh, to bring home, not real fish, little uh, cardboard fish to bring home to you. And it's just a wonderful story. And what they're learning is that God called his disciples to be fishers of men. And the application for the children is that God has called each one of them to be his special helpers, just like he called Andrew and Peter and James and John. It's a great story. Well, ladies, I am thrilled to be back here with you this morning. Um, and I have an opening story that I want to share with you. Um, and uh, kind of my theme this morning is that things don't always turn out the way we planned them to, right? Um, things did not turn out the way I had planned them the last couple of weeks. Um, my daughter, as, as you know, has gone through a pregnancy, and um, we had planned, this was the plan, that I would be there for her labor. Today was her actual due date. And so I would have gone yesterday to Tampa, and I would be there as she labored to encourage her and to love on her, and it, she just wanted Nick and I in the room for her labor, and I was thrilled that she had invited me to participate in that experience. And she said, well, when it comes time for the delivery, I want you to leave, which was great for me because I've shared with you I don't do blood and stories like that. I just, yeah, I tend to faint. So I was like, great, yes, it'll just be Nick and the medical team for the delivery. That will be fine. That'll, that works for me. So that was our plan. Well, things didn't go according to plan. As you know, uh, many, many of you know, if you've been here in the last couple of weeks, two weeks ago today, my daughter had her baby. And so the plan kind of blew up on us. Um, I woke up uh, two weeks ago today, Thursday morning. I do what I do every Thursday morning. I got up and I went into my husband's office and I um, had some quiet time and I started reviewing my lesson a little bit. Then I went and jumped in the shower, went to the kitchen to get a cup of coffee. And as I'm in the kitchen, my husband's phone is sitting on the counter and it starts ringing and I look at it and it's my son-in-law. And panic went through my whole body. And I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? And he said, did you not get the text? And I said, what text? And he said, we texted Tom at 2 in the morning. Taylor's water broke and we were heading to the hospital. At that point, I don't want to tell you how angry I was that my husband had left his phone in the kitchen and didn't bring it into the bedroom. We missed that text. But I moved on from there. And... Um, <laughs> It wasn't about me, right? So we're, I moved on, and I said, well, I, I, are you kidding, Nick? Or is this really happening? And he's like, Leslie, I'm not kidding. She's, we're having a baby. And I was like, okay, 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 okay. So first thing I do, I, said, I talk to Taylor, and I said, look, okay, I love you. You're going to do great, and I'm going to be there as soon as I can. So I get Tom working on getting me a reservation on his iPad, and I call Tracy Persky, and I, <laughs> sorry, y'all, but I said, I don't care what you do with CBS this morning, I am out of here. <laughs> I didn't say it exactly like that, but I said, you're in charge, and didn't she do an amazing job? I mean, I tell you, I know, I know. In fact, the whole team did. I just love this team. I love serving with this team. Um, they're just a godsend, but they just took over, and I was in baby mode. The problem was, I figured, you know, I'm going to just get on the, an 8 o'clock flight. First flight I could get was not till 
11, after, a little after 11 o'clock. And so it was like time was standing still. It was just not moving. I could not get there fast enough. I wanted to be in Tampa, but there was no way. I mean, it was just, it was excruciatingly slow. Finally, I get to the airport. We're boarding the airplane. And so I called Nick one last time and I said, how's she doing? And he said, she's doing good. She's laboring. We just did an epidural, so she's good. But the contractions are getting stronger and closer together. And at that point, I had just pretty much resigned myself to the reality that I was going to miss his birth. I, I, I just, it was, God's timing is perfect, and I understand that. But I was just not going to be there for the birth. So I get on the plane, and oh my gosh, you know how this always is, the pilot, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> it's about an hour and 50 minute flight over to Tampa, but they've rerouted us today, and they're going to take us, and instead of going straight across the Gulf, we're going to go up across the land because of weather, it's going to take us about two hours and 20 minutes. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> So, okay, whatever. So we, uh, we land, and I pull out my phone right away, and I text Nick, how's she doing? How's the baby? Because I'm just assuming the baby's already come. And he didn't, nothing, nothing. No reply, no nothing. And my mind starts going to that bad place, right, and imagining all the worst-case scenario. And it seemed like an hour, but it was probably like four minutes. <laughs> he, he finally texted me back, and he said, She's doing good. She's just starting to push. Seriously? She's just now starting to push? Oh my gosh, I might make it. And at that moment, I started sprinting through the Tampa airport. I'm like, get out of my way. <laughs> and so I go, my, my plan was to go get an Uber and to take me to the hospital. So I get down to the Uber stand where all the car share stuff is, and I pull up my app, and it says that due to unusually high traffic, there's going to be a 30-minute wait for the next Uber. Well, oh my goodness, well, seriously? So I went old school, and I went and found the taxi stand. I'm like, I don't care how much it costs. And, and at this point, I had pretty, okay, some of you are too young to remember this. Anybody remember from Terms of Endearment when Shirley MacLaine went crazy because she wanted something, she needed medicine for her daughter, and she's like, get my daughter medicine! I was like, get me to the hospital! <laughs> and this sweet taxi driver, he's like, get in, lady, and he like puts the pedal to the mouth, got me to the hospital in record time. I don't know how we did that, but um, I made it into the delivery room with 30 minutes to spare. 30 minutes later, this little guy, we got the picture. Oh, oh. Don't you just want to eat him up? Isn't he the cutest little thing? This is Sam. And, and by the way, he, he's the star of the show, but my daughter did an amazing job. I want to tell y'all, she did an amazing job. Um, it, was, it was, I mean, just crazy. But my, the point of my story, we can leave Sam up there for a while. I'll just stare at him. The point of my story is that a lot of times we plan things and it, it just doesn't happen the way we plan them, right? I had planned to be there for the labor to help and encourage her. I didn't get to do any of that. As I walked into the hospital room, I'm figuring she's going to want me to just come in and kiss her and say goodbye and I'll go wait in the hall. She said, please stay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. But I did it. I'm so proud of myself. I didn't faint or anything. And I got to witness the birth of my grandson. It was just such a special, special moment. All glory to God in heaven. But things didn't go according to my plan. This morning as we look at the scriptures, we see that I don't think things are going according to Paul's plan either. I don't think this is how he had it, had envisioned this second missionary trip going. I don't think it was exactly falling into place as he uh, thought it would. But as we peel back the details of our lesson today, I think what we see is God's faithfulness at every step along Paul's journey. And so as Paul may have been discouraged at points because things weren't going the way he planned, he understood who God was, and he trusted in God's faithfulness at every step. And because God was faithful always, 
Paul was able to, in turn, be a faithful servant and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we go through the lesson this morning, I would ask you, do you trust in God's faithfulness? And if you do, are you um, responding the way Paul does? Are you responding to God's faithfulness by being a faithful, obedient servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these encouraging scriptures that you give us this morning. We thank you that you are always faithful through the good times, through the dark times, and everything in between. You are faithful. And Father, let us respond to your loving faithfulness by being obedient servants for your glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I mentioned the fact that this second missionary journey of Paul's might not be going according to plan, right? So let's let's review where we are in his trip. We've got our little trusty map here. He started over in Antioch, went up through uh, Tarsus, uh, got to this Antioch, and then he wants to go, his plan is to go into Asia, right, and to bring the gospel into Asia. But God says, no, 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 we're not doing that. That's not the right time. So he puts a stop sign. So that's not the plan, right? So Paul goes on up here and God calls him over into Greece, Macedonia. Well, I don't know that that was part of Paul's plan. He gets over here and he gets to Philippi. And what happens when he's in Philippi? He's falsely accused. He's beaten up and he's thrown into jail. You think that's part of Paul's plan? I I don't know. To me. That's not how I would plan my missionary journey, right? And so I'm thinking things probably aren't going the way he had planned them, but God was always there with him. And so God gets him out of that pickle there in jail, and then they move on, and they, um, he and Silas move over to, um, they move to Thessalonica, right? And they're only there for a little bit of time, and then they're run out of town. They go to Berea again. They're there for a little bit of time. They're run out of town. And so then they, Paul finally moves on to Athens, and that's where he was last week. And he's in Athens, and, you know, the people are really ridiculing him, and there's not very many people coming to the Lord there. And it's just not the way maybe he had pictured it. This wasn't what he thought it was going to be. And so Paul leaves Athens, and he goes on 50 miles east over here to um, Corinth, and this is where our story takes place today, in Corinth. Now, I don't think this is what Paul had planned. All this is not going real well, I would think, you know, in uh, secular ter- in human terms, in Paul's day. Um, but, it, it, I mean, it's not going according to plan. Sorry, let me get back, go back. Um, And I think he's defeated, maybe discouraged at this point in his journey. But does he quit and say, you know, this isn't what I wanted. This is not, I didn't see it going like this. I'm going to quit. I'm going to not do anything. No, I think what Paul understood that God was faithful, not only in the good times when people are coming to the Lord in droves, when you've got a great team of missionaries around you, when everybody's saying, oh, you're preaching so great. Of course, God's faithful then. But Paul understands God's faithful in the difficult times too. And God is still with him, even though things aren't going according to the plan. He understands God is still with him and still faithful and still leading and guiding him. And so Paul's response is not, well, I'm going to quit. Paul's response is, okay, God, I'm digging in even deeper and I'm going to continue to serve you. I'm going to be faithful to do what you've called me to do. So that's when he starts his ministry here in Corinth. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Corinth. Corinth, at the time that Paul is there, is the fourth largest city in the world. It is very wealthy. It is the center of commerce in in Greece. um, They manage two huge seaports. And so people from all over the world come in and out of Corinth. And so it's a very international city. But it's mainly dominated by the Romans and the Greeks, But there is a very large Jewish population that lives in Corinth at the time. So let me give you just a little bit of the atmosphere. I want you for a second to close your eyes. Close your eyes, y'all. And I'm going to try and paint a picture of first century Corinth. I want you to imagine for me the seediest, 
sleaziest, most unwholesome red light district in any American city that you can imagine. You got it in your mind? Yes, kind of gross. So open your eyes. We don't want to stay focused there. We're at Bible study. <laughs> so let's not focus there. But I, this is the picture of what Corinth was in this first century. It was a hub of sexual immorality. I mean, it was, it was yucky, y'all. In fact, the Greeks had coined a term to Corinthianize. If you had been Corinthianized, that means you led a life of lustful debauchery, okay? So it was a yucky, yucky place. This was, Corinth was the home of the Greek goddess Aphrodite. She was the goddess of love and pleasure and procreation. And they had built a temple there to, in her honor. And if you wanted to worship Aphrodite, you would have sex with one of the thousand temple prostitutes. And this was your form of worship. So it's yucky, right? This is a dark, dark place that God has called Paul to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul understood what I think many of us need to understand that our light can't shine really bright unless it's in a really dark place, okay? I think a lot of times, I know I am very guilty of saying, well, my light is shining in my little holy huddle, you know, up here in Cyprus where everybody is like-minded and we all believe in Jesus Christ and we're all trying to follow in the Lord's ways and my light is shining brightly. Well, no, because everybody's light is shining bright. Sometimes the Lord calls us to those very, very dark places so that his light may illuminate the darkness and shine forth. And that's exactly where he is called Paul. And that's why um, Paul is so obedient and he stays for a year and a half because there's a lot of souls to be won for Jesus Christ there in this dark place. So it's no coincidence that as soon as he gets there, he meets this great couple, Ananias and Sapphira. Now, they are Jews who had been run out of Rome. Rome has sent down an edict at this time that um, no, we don't want any Jews living in our city. And so they had to flee. And they end up down here in Greece in this city of Corinth, okay? Now, um, it's not a coincidence that they have run into Paul. This is God's providence has brought them together because these two people, remember Paul, is, things aren't going the, maybe the way he thought they'd go. I have a feeling Paul may be a little discouraged, a little defeated. These two people come into his life and they are a ray of sunshine. They are bringing encouragement and just pouring into him and helping him. They become lifelong, invaluable ministry partners with Paul, okay? And so this is, brings us to our first point this morning, that God is faithful to give us encouragement when we need it most. He brought these two people into their lives so that Paul would feel and be filled up with the encouragement that they are going to give him, okay? Now, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you need some encouragement. I would encourage you <laughs> to look around. There's women all around you that want to encourage you. Reach out to your core leader. Reach out to someone sitting near you and ask them to pray with you and for you to help you in your faith because this is what the body of Christ is about, building up and encouraging one another so that we can go out. The, the encouragement isn't just to make you feel good about yourself. The encouragement is so that you will be willing to be that faithful servant and go out and serve the Lord Jesus Christ for his glory. Okay, so Aquila and Priscilla, they, I, I mean, this just is so beautiful how God works this out. They're in the same profession as Paul. And Paul goes back and he remembers, yeah, I can make tents. And so he cut because he gets to Corinth and he doesn't have very much money. And so Monday through Friday, he's doing a day job and he's making tents. On the weekends, on the Sabbath, Scripture said, he goes to the synagogue to preach about Jesus, the risen Messiah. Okay. But let's look at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, 
Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So it doesn't say there specifically in this passage, but over in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, when Silas and Timothy came to Corinth, they brought with them an offering from Macedonia. And so I was able to quit my day job and I was able to go preaching full time. Talk about encouragement, right? This is encouragement. So now the, the gospel message of Jesus Christ can go full time through Paul there in Corinth. But as we've seen time and time again, the Jewish leaders there in town weren't so thrilled that Paul's preaching full time, right? And they say, you, you can't do that anymore. We don't want you preaching here. And so verse, so it says that Paul shook off his garments, remember? And then verse 6b, it says, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That's a very somber and serious statement, isn't it? Your blood be on your heads. And it, as I studied, it brought me back to a passage in Ezekiel chapter 3 where God is speaking to Ezekiel and he um, urges him to be a watchman. Now, a watchman was one who would stand on the city walls and literally watch to see if impending danger was coming, and when he saw danger was coming, it was his duty to turn around and warn the people within the city walls of the danger that's coming. And then if they ignored the warning, then the blood was on their heads. The watchman has done his job in, in delivering the warning. I see Paul as being a watchman for God here. I see him as being, taking on the full responsibility of delivering the gospel message. And that's what he does. He says, look, and this is what he's preaching every day. Jesus Christ born and he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross and then he rose from the dead three days later to rule and reign in heaven with his father. And if you believe on that and repent of your sins, then you will be saved and you will escape the judgment and the wrath that is coming. This was Paul's watchman moment, and he's out there telling everybody about it, but they won't listen. So he says, the blood is on your heads, because I've done my job here. And what does he do? He says, okay, I'm going to leave the synagogue, but I ain't going far. I'm just going right next door. And he moves into the house next door. I just love God's humor, don't you? I think that's so humorous. He's like, hi, I'm right here. You know, I'm not going too far. And, but it's not just humorous. It's brilliant on Paul's part. Because think of this strategic location. He sees people coming and going from the synagogue all the time. And how he's sitting here, he can say, hey, why don't you come sit down, have a cup of coffee with me? And I'll tell you the rest of the story that you didn't hear over there. What a brilliant opportunity this is. But Paul is also in a position, the flip side of that opportunity, is he's sitting in the crosshairs of those people that want to get rid of him, right? And he's just right there all the time in their face. And so this brings us to an interesting part of the text, verses 9 and 10. One day the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. I'm the one... Um, and no one is going to attack or harm you because I have many people in the city. So God says, don't be afraid. Now, he doesn't say don't be afraid if Paul's not afraid. So we know that Paul is afraid, right? He's scared. And I don't know about you, but many times I am guilty of placing Paul and other biblical heroes up on a pedestal. And I think, oh, no, they don't know the same struggles that I go through. They don't get fearful. They're, I mean, all we read about is how brave he is and how determined he is and how, I mean, he's just focused. He, he doesn't get scared. Scripture tells us clearly he does. He was afraid. In fact, he writes to the church at Corinth later on, to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, when I first got to Corinth, I was trembling. I was fearful. I was distressed. I was weak. So he is afraid. But God comes to him in a dream in the night and says, don't be afraid. This brings us to our second point. God is faithful to meet us where we are. 
in our fear, in our loneliness, in our brokenness, or in our sorrow. Wherever we are, that's where God will meet us. Notice here, it's in the nighttime that God comes to him and speaks to him. I don't know about y'all, but this is where I experience most of my fears in the nighttime. Wake up in the middle of the night and you start thinking about the what ifs and the how comes and the I don't knows and all those unanswered questions. They always come to us in the middle of the night, don't they? What we learn from this is God meets us right where we are in our darkness, in the middle of the night, right there where we are. Will you allow him to comfort you when you wake up fearful? Will you allow him to be there? Will you trust in and acknowledge his faithfulness even in the darkness? Finally, in our scripture today, the author Luke gives us a detailed account of yet another attempt by the Jewish leaders to squash the spread of the gospel. But this time is going to be different because we see that the Roman governor of um, Corinth, a man by the name of Galileo, he is going to unwittingly make a historic decision that will not only protect Paul from persecution, but will make sure that the advancement of the gospel continues. It is a fabulous story, but we need a little bit of history kind of to understand the details of what's happening here. In this first century, Rome was in the process of, um, they had begun to deify, or that is to make gods, out of their human rulers, okay? So their emperors, they made gods. And the, the, they had set out a new edict, a new law, that all Roman citizens were required by law to participate in the festivals and the ceremonies that would honor the emperors as gods, okay? But there was an exemption, Rome had exempted the Jews from having to honor the emperors as gods because Rome recognized Judaism as a legitimate religion and, and they um, worshiped only one God. So they said, okay, you are exempted from coming and worshiping our God, and so, which was a cool thing, right? So the Jews didn't have to worship the emperor. But here's the, uh, this is just what's so great. So this was the law that we're talking about here when we look at verse 13. The Jews say, this man, Paul, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. And that law was worshiping the emperor, okay? And so they're saying, he's telling people that they can't worship the emperor. And Galileo, <laughs> this is just so great. They, they come, the Jews come to Galileo and they say, look, those Christian people... The, the, Paul, the people, Paul and all those guys, they're not part of us. <laughs> they're not part of Judaism. They don't get the same exemption we get. And so, the, uh-uh, we don't have anything to do with them. They're a whole nother sect, okay? And so, they need to follow your law, and they're not doing it. So, you need to get on them, right? But, and the, so, they're trying to force Rome to make a decision, but it's going to backfire on them. Because the problem is, Galileo, who is a pagan, I mean, he worships all kinds of gods. He looks at Judaism, Christianity, and he doesn't see a difference. He, he doesn't appreciate or understand the theological nuances between Judaism and Christianity, nor could he care less. They're all the same to him. And, and we think, how could he look at that and they're all the same? Because we think there so, it's glaring, the difference between Judaism and Christianity, right? But for, to a pagan who doesn't understand it, uh, I mean, he wouldn't have known or cared what the difference is. And I read a great modern day um, example. How many of you, if I asked you, do you know the nuances, the differences between a Shiite Muslim and a Sunni Muslim? Anybody could tell me the difference? No, I mean, most of us can't. We just kind of lump all Muslims into one group. That's exactly what Galileo did. He goes, look, Christians, Jews, you're all lumped into the same group, okay? I'm just going to put you all over there. Therefore, you are all exempt, including the Christians. You don't have to worship that one God, which... Number one, it spared Paul from persecution. And number two, 
the, the governor here unwittingly is putting a stamp of approval on Paul being able to continue spreading the gospel message throughout all of Europe. I mean, he set a legal historical precedent here. It's just a God thing. So this brings up our third point, third and final point. God is faithful to advance the gospel, and he will always advance his gospel message. Ladies, things in Paul's life didn't necessarily go according to plan, but he chose to trust in God's faithfulness despite his circumstances. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and things are not going according to plan. Maybe your marriage is off in the ditch, and that's not what you had planned when you said, I do. Maybe your adult child is in a phase of rebellion or in a place of darkness, and that's not what you had planned when they placed that baby in your arms. Or maybe it's a health issue and you have received a diagnosis or you have a loved one that has received a diagnosis or maybe it's chronic pain and this is not what you had planned for your life right now. I pray that you will trust in God's unchangeable nature, in his consistent trustworthiness and his unwavering love for you and that you will recognize his constant faithfulness. No matter what circumstance you are in, he is faithful to you. And when you understand and appreciate that, I pray that you will be able to turn around and serve him with a faithful, obedient heart, giving him all the glory in spite of the circumstance. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these scriptures that show us your faithfulness. Father, you are faithful to encourage us. You are faithful to meet us where we are. And you are faithful to continue spreading the gospel throughout this world. Let us be obedient, faithful servants and participate with you as we share your gospel message. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.